What do you love about New York City? Uh, the vibrancy, uh, the activity. Uh, there's a thousand and one things to do, and if you did those thousand and one things, there's a, a million more. You can do anything and see anything you want in New York City. Whereabouts did you grow up? I grew out here. I uh, grew up out here on Long Island. Uh, in Nassau County in a village called Mineola, which I still live in. Mm. What was it like growing up in Long Island and having such a vibrant city in the background so close to you? Growing up on Long Island uh, is, uh, Long Island's a great place to be. It's a great place to grow up. And having New York City uh, just about 22 miles, depending on where you're going, uh, away from you, a uh, 40-minute ride on a train is just phenomenal. You can go in there for a night. You can go in there for a weekend. You go in there for the day. Uh, is never see the same thing twice. When did you realize that public safety was for you? I realized public safety was for me when my, uh, through my parents. My mom, back in the 70s, helped start a, our local ambulance corps in Mineola. Um, my dad joined, uh, my older brother joined, I joined. Uh, we were, both of my parents were involved, as was my uh, older brother, my sister, and my younger brother in scouting and just giving back to the community was a family theme. Do you feel that the call to service lives within one's DNA and is passed down through lineage? The call to service uh, to your community, to your, and, and not just where you live, but a, a larger community is definitely in somebody's DNA and it's definitely in mine. It's, I don't know if you can, uh, to do it well, I don't know if something you can learn. It's got to be in you. When did you decide that you wanted to become a law enforcement officer? I, I, w I was in school. Uh, I, I, was, I was a very good student in school, uh, but I hated school. And uh, my friends were taking tests, and one of my college professors was like, hey, you should take some of these civil service tests. And I'm like, I don't want to be a cop. And I'm like, I just try it. So I went with my friends, took tests. I took the NYPD test. I scored very high on the test, and uh, my investigator calls me up, and he says, hey, you know, we're going to start your investigation to get you on the job. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to be a cop. And they're like, why not? I go, ah, nothing, something I just didn't want to do. You know, I'm a volunteer firefighter in my hometown, I still am. Um, I was in the ambulance car. I am not any longer. I still help out with scouts. I'm coaching Little League. I'm, so I'm involved in community service. I just didn't feel the desire to be a, a cop at the time. And then... Um, uh, he, he said, well, what do you want to be? And I said, well, I was looking to be an attorney, but I don't like school. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, if you join the police department, you go to six months in the academy, you don't ever have to go to school again. I said, really? He said, yeah. I go, all right, I'll try it. <laughs> 20 years later, I had a great career, a great time. I had great people I worked with, uh, and it was absolutely like every job. Some days are better than others, but on the whole, I had a fantastic run. That's great. That's great. Would you mind kind of walking me through your career, where you started, and kind of going forward? Yeah, sure. Uh, I started, I joined the New York City Police Department in uh, January of 1984. I uh, did six months in the academy. <laughs> and then um, uh, after that, we went to a uh, field training unit called a neighborhood stabilization unit at the time for six months. Uh, I was assigned to uh, Times Square for six months. It was a completely eye-opening experience for me coming from Long Island into Times Square in the, uh, the mid-80s. What was it like in the mid-80s? It was crazy. And Times Square and New York City in the mid-80s was crazy. We had, um, there were six police officers on the south side of 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue and six police officers on the north side of 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. And the whole the entire area was flooded with police officers and there was still shooting, stabbings and things going on. It was absolute mayhem. Total eye-opening experience for me. Um, and then after that six months in Times Square, I went to the Bronx. I worked in the 43rd Precinct. I uh, had a great time there. I uh, worked with actually Sector, my sector car partner, uh, Jimmy DuPont, is uh, someone I worked in a store in Mineola with as a kid. We got on a job together, went to the academy together, did our training together in Times Square, uh, and then we went and became sector car partners in the, in the 43rd Precinct in the Bronx. Um, and then I applied to and got accepted into the emergency service unit in 1987, and I worked in uh, the Bronx until 1996. And then from 1996 to the time I retired in 2004, I was in Lower Manhattan. 
Would you give a quick explanation of the roles and the responsibilities of emergency services? The New York City Police Department's Emergency Service Unit is uh, the SWAT and the rescue team uh, of the city of New York. Anything major that goes on and anything minor that we can help out a police officer with will do. We handle anything and everything from uh, helping somebody get into their car that they've locked their keys into, uh, to barricade hostage jobs, bomb jobs, plane crashes, train crashes, building collapses, uh, massive uh, shootings, uh, anything and everything. If it's going on, we'll be, our unit will be there. It's a citywide unit, probably about 350, 400 police officers, men and women right now, um, uh, dedicated group of individuals like you've never seen before. Yeah, what blew me away when I started learning more about ESU was just the diversity in the skill sets. You know, I, I, I typically interact with, say, a, a, on the West Coast, a SWAT team, and they're, they're phenomenal. You know, great shooters, great tacticians, but when there is something like a vehicle extrication, well, that's when the fire department shows up and they kind of handle that side of the house or uh, medical aid. I mean, they can have, you know, they can respond to mass casualty incidents, but most of them are not EMTs. And ESU is all of these things. Yeah. Pretty fascinating group. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the emergency service unit is very diverse. It is very talented, and they bring in a tre tremendous skill set. And the training is intense, and uh, you're expected to do everything you possibly can to, for everybody that you come across. What was your favorite part of the job? My favorite part of being a cop was um, the cops I worked with and helping people. Uh, I had a, I had a great people that officers that we worked with. I had a fantastic partner uh, for 13 years. Um, being in the emergency service unit is like no other unit in the police department. The camaraderie is thick. Uh, if one hurts, we all hurt. And if one's celebrating, we all celebrate. It's uh, a very big family. I'd like to spend some time to discuss September 11, 2001. I'd like to know how your day started. My day started for September 11th, actually, on September 10th. I was, I worked at midnight, went in at 11.30. I, I got up about 7 o'clock um, in the evening on September 10th after only sleeping a few hours because I was going in that night and I needed to just take the edge off. Uh, I went to work that night, started at 11.30. I was working with uh, police officer Kenny Winkler. We were in the uh, smaller rescue truck and relatively uneventful night. Uh, a couple of um, auto extrication jobs, uh, uh, a couple of you know times we were backing up the precinct on some heavy jobs that the gun runs that they were on. But overall, it was kind of uneventful. Uh, Eight o'clock in the morning rolls around uh, the end of our shift. I uh, leave the building to uh, head back home. It was the first day that my two boys, who were um, six and nine at the time, were going to be in school full time and actually I could get some sleep uh, because I'd normally walk ho get home and I'd take the kids and I'd have the kids all day long and, and while my wife was working, my wife would come home in the afternoon, I'd give her the kids and then I'd take a couple hours of sleep. I'd get up, help them with the homework, get them to bed, take a shower, and then I'd go back to work. So t that day was the first day that I was actually going to be able to sleep till they got home from school. Um, so I'm on the train uh, going home at Long Island Railroad, and uh, it was 2001, so I had my Walkman uh, on, and uh, I was listening to a radio show, <coughs> and they were talking about a plane that had hit the Trade Center. And I, was, and my, I covered that area. Uh, the, the guys that relieved Kenny and I that morning uh, would, were there when that, when that first call came in. So I said, it was a beautiful day. How could this possibly happen? I thought it might have been a small plane. Uh, the, the individual, the pilot, maybe had a, a medical emergency and, uh, and hit one of the towers. Um, begin, first, when I heard it, I thought it was a joke. But then I heard a more serious tone to it, and I said, oh, this can't be a joke. I uh, hopped in my car, um, went home, turned on the TV. I yelled to my wife that a plane had hit one of the towers. She was getting ready for work. She comes running into the den, and then we saw the second plane hit. And then I knew right away I, I had to get back to work. When you watched that second plane hit, what went through your mind besides having to go back to work? We were under attack. 
when I first turned the TV on, I saw that big gaping hole. I knew right away it wasn't a small plane. And then when you saw the other plane come in, I absolutely knew we were, we were under attack. And it was going to be us to, to defend the city, us meaning New York City Police Department. Military, we didn't have a military, active military base in, in New York City. It was going to be us. So tell me about the race back. Okay, um, 2001, uh, I was a volunteer fire chief in my town. I uh, hopped in the chief's car and, and I raced back into Manhattan. Uh, state police and uh, the city police officers were diverting traffic out of the city. You weren't allowed into the city unless you were a police officer, a firefighter, or an EMS worker. Um, they let me through. I come through the Midtown Tunnel. I come out of the Midtown Tunnel on the Manhattan side and there were civilians directing traffic, trying to get uh, emergency vehicles through traffic so they can get downtown. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, usually uh, New, York's, New York gets a bum rap sometimes about the harshness of, uh, of us, uh, but it was, everybody was pitching in that day, just trying to help out the best they could. I get down to my building on 21st Street, where I had left just like an hour before, and uh, the guys that relieved me were already down at the Trade Center, including Kenny Winkler. Kenny Winkler was um, off duty, like I was, but he stayed around the quarters because he had something to do that day, uh, and he was in jeans and a t-shirt, and this, this job came in. He hopped on our truck and then went down with the guys on a day tour. Um, other off-duty police officers from my unit were coming into the building. We were grabbing equipment. Uh, we were grabbing rescue equipment. We were grabbing guns. And then ne next to our building is the police academy. It was the police academy. And in the bottom, uh, the basement of the police academy, we had a range, a firing range. And the range officers came up and they were asking us for guns. So we were giving them some of our machine guns and our rifles because they had to protect the city. And uh, so we took a, a boatload of equipment down and on our way down to uh, the Trade Center, um, Sergeant O'Connor from our unit uh, was kind of leading the pack, and he stops off at a construction site and where they have payloaders and excavators, and he stops, and one of the buildings has come down already, and he's talking to the construction workers, and he says, you know, and he's talking like nothing's going on. He's like, hey, you know, there's a, you know, the towers, they got hit by a couple of planes and one of the buildings came down. And, uh, you know, if you could start packing up your stuff, we could probably use you downtown at the site there to help us. And we're, we're screaming at Sarge. And we're like, Sarge, let's go. Let's get down there. Hurry up. Let's go down. He's like, all right, we'll get there. We'll get there. And he's talking to these guys. And we're like, Sarge, let's go. Let's go. Uh, finally, we get down there. And um, thanks to Sergeant O'Connor, we're all here because uh, that we got down there just as the second tower finished collapsing. If uh, he didn't stop to talk to those construction workers to start to tell them to tell them to pack their equipment up and get downtown, because they had no idea what was going on, um, it might have ended differently for us. Did you ever think, did the thought ever cross your mind when you saw that second plane hit, you saw the size, you finally had a chance to see the size of the hole in the North Tower, did you ever think they would come down? When I saw the, the gaping hole in the tower from the first plane to hit and the second plane hit that one, uh, I didn't think it would come down. But hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So you look back to the 1993 bombing where the experts on TV, and I think we sunk our own ship on this, were saying, no, you know, the World Trade Center can hit, take a hit from a 707. So maybe we put the, that thought into somebody's mind. You know, a bigger plane, who knows? But I didn't think those buildings would come down. Tell me about arriving on scene. So we arrived on the scene just as the second tower had finished collapsing. <coughs> and we went over to City Hall Park, uh, where we were directed to go. And uh, everybody that, was, uh, that could, that was already there from my unit, was directed to go to City Hall Park to regroup and to uh, get an accounting of you know, whoever, where everybody was. And uh, the guys and girls coming from the Trade Center were just covered in dust, bleeding, hurt, limping, carrying each other. And we were going over to them and like, yo, guys, good to see you, you all right, what's going on? Have you seen Joe, have you seen Mike? Have you seen we were asking for everybody else that we knew that was down there. Um, and some said they don't know what happened to them. We had no idea what was going on. So we got lined up, 
and they broke us up into two groups and uh, it was tactics and rescue. So they went down the line and said, okay, you five guys are on tactics, you five guys are on rescue, you five guys do tactics, you guys five on rescue. They split us up and gave us areas around the trade center. So if you were on tactics, you were assigned to the perimeter. We have no idea what else is going to happen to us, whether it's going to be another attack, whether it's going to be a ground issue, where there's going to be gunfight in the streets. And then those of us, I was assigned to a rescue operation, were given certain areas of what was the trade center to start to look for su survivors. Uh, we got some equipment and we started walking down towards the Trade Center and we turned the corner and one of our large emergency service trucks uh, from Queens was burning and we were like, oh my god, what? This, it was like a movie um, and debris, things were broken, cars were crushed, buildings were wrecked. Uh, we just started searching and searching all day long and we were we were finding bar body parts, but we weren't finding anybody that was alive. We were finding people who were crushed, uh, arms, legs, but we weren't finding anybody alive. We were crawling into crevices, trying to get down below the surface, the level. And uh, there was one point <coughs> we were climbing down, down uh, this escalator, this massive escalator down to the, the lower levels of the Trade Center. And it was, the buildings above it were collapsed on top of the escalator, and we had to crawl down head first. And then we got to the bottom, and it was just down to the ground. You couldn't move anywhere. So we had to back up, all the way up, the, those, uh, the escalator stairs, uh, crawling. And um, then we go to another area, and another area, and all day long we were searching and find, not finding anybody. That, again, that was alive. The, um, then there came a point where, um, Building 7 collapsed later in the day. And then after, when that collapsed, the organized rescue effort was pulled off the, the, the pile. For days it was called, we called it the Trade Center. Trade Center. And then weeks went by and then it morphed into uh, the pile, for just vernacular for us. And then um, I don't know when it became ground zero and then that, that kind of just stuck. But um, we were pulled off the Trade Center, the, the pile, and then uh, we were regrouping and see who else we lost or didn't lose, just getting uh, another accountability again. And then we were in this building on um, south of uh, Liberty and just sitting in the lobby more or less, you know, just waiting for the next orders to go back in. When I say organized rescue effort was pulled off, that was those of us from the fire, EMS, uh, the PD, uh, people had radios that were given certain areas to go into. There were so many civilians that were looking to help too, and construction workers, that they had no idea that they were supposed to come off the pile. So we were in, a, in one of these uh, lobbies of an office building, and uh, one of our sergeants, uh, Timmy Adrat, grabs a bunch of us and says, hey, let's, we can't go into the pile, so let's go search some of the buildings around it. <coughs> so we go, we go on the south side of Liberty Street, and we uh, are going into a building that's gouged out from the collapse of the Trade Center. And we climb into one of the buildings. We search the building, nobody was in it. We come out, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, we write on the uh, wall in the dust, NYPD issue, the date and the time, uh, so that the next people coming up know that it was searched, uh, searched once. And then uh, so somebody else could you know, do a more thorough search. We do it a quick search, we came out of the building, and then a firefighter comes over to us from the pile and he says, hey, emergency, you guys got a couple of cops that are hurt, you know, towards the center of the pile. And we're like, oh, where are they? Oh, they're over there. And he just points in a general direction. We had thought that they were um, police officers like myself and the team that I was with that had come after the buildings had collapsed. So uh, we started climbing over the debris piles and jumping from I-beam to I-beam and slipping and, and losing our balance and getting to this one area. And there was a police officer who was in front of me, Greg Welch from my unit. He slips, slices up his leg pretty good. So I stop, I said, Greg, you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, just keep going, get those guys out of here. So um, there was, there was a, a guy waving a flashlight and this is, this is about eight o'clock, 7.30, eight o'clock at night, sort of uh, somewhere around there. And uh, it was dark, uh, dust and smoke was burning and blowing everywhere, so it was very difficult to see. <coughs> it was a gentleman wave, waving a flashlight. Somebody was waving a flashlight. 
So I'm assuming that was the place to, that we had to go to. So we're, we're headed over to that. Uh, and we get to that guy eventually. And uh, there was a chief, a fire chief before that, in between us and the gentleman waving a flashlight. And buildings four and five were two nine-story office buildings. And they were still burning, been burning all day. And they started to collapse. And he's, he's trying to do the right thing by not letting us go into that collapse zone. And as we're approaching him, he's saying, hey, guys, you can't come in here. There's a collapse zone. These buildings are coming down. And we're like, hey, we got two guys in there. We're just going to grab them. We'll get out of here in 10 minutes. Blah, blah. He's like, no, you can't come in here, guys. You can't. We're like, okay. We kind of really didn't listen to him. We just kind of blew past him. And um, we, I get to this guy who's waving his flashlight. And he could have been the Pope. I have no idea who he was. I don't know. I don't remember what he was wearing. It didn't matter to me what he looked like or anything. And I, I just come over to him and I said, what do you got? And he says, I got uh, there's two cops in this hole. So I look in this hole. It's about the size of a manhole. And <coughs> I had an air pack on like the firefighters wear. I had a gun belt on. Uh, I had a rope harness on that we use when we climb bridges. Because I was on the rescue end of things. So I didn't know what we were, were going to get caught up in. And I drop into this hole, and um, there's a former Marine in there, um, uh, Sergeant Carnes. And he says, like, there's two cops in here. I, I can see him, but I can't. I, I can hear him, but I can't see him. So Patty McGee comes in behind me, another of my, one of the officers, police officers that I was working with that day. Um, and then it's a, a civilian, Chuck Sarika, comes in that hole. And then Patty and I had all this equipment on. So Chuck said he just had a sweatshirt on that said paramedic on it. And he climbs down in this tiny openings and he's crawling down. And he yells back to us that he can see these guys and get to them. But you're not going to, he yells to Patty and I that you're not going to be able to get down here with your equipment on, all that stuff on. So um, <coughs> we took off all our stuff in the hole there and uh, passed out our uh, equipment and um not that I would need it in that hole, and Patty wouldn't need it in the hole, but um, when I took off my gun belt, uh, I, I knew we were going to die there. Uh, I, ha I had nothing. Uh, when things go bad enough for a police officer, you walk into a store and there's a robber, you come upon something. If you can't de-escalate it, your last, la absolute last resort is a firearm. Um, and, and that's kind of like your security blanket. When, it, when all goes bad, uh, I got this. Um, it wouldn't have done me any good at all, right? There was no bad guys down in that hole, but I just had a feeling. I just took everything off. And when I passed that gun belt down, I'm like, shh, I'm, I'm not getting out of here. Um, so we crawled down to uh, where Chuck was, and <coughs> it was about 20 feet on an angle down. And we were squeezing through areas that were so tight. Uh, you just had to pull yourself through. Uh, they, the, the, some of the I-beams were burning hot, and you, you had to get by as quick as you can. You had to twist around another one and up around, and, and it was really uh, maze-like to get down through this tiny place. And um, there was no room for us to turn around to even get out if we had to. We were just crawling and crawling deeper in there. And um, I said to myself, I asked my kids to be good. Uh, I asked them to take care of mom. make me proud and I apologize for getting myself killed I said that all of myself down as I was crawling down to this hole because I didn't think we were getting out of there uh, we get down to the bottom on this 20 foot angle and uh, Port Authority police officer Dominic Pizzullo was there he's, he's dead uh, he's crushed and he's slumped over a, uh, a big piece of concrete and he was by an elevator shaft. So we went down 20 feet, we hung a left and went about 10 feet across where Dominic was. And then Will Jimeno from the Port Authority Police Department was about uh, another 20 feet back. So we're kind of like in the downward horseshoe shape. And to get to Will, you could see Will. But the only thing, he's laying on his back and the only thing you can see of Will is his head and his right arm. Everything else is, he looked like he was poured out of a dump truck. And he was in this tiny little opening about 20 feet away from us. Uh, the only way you could get to Will is to crawl on your side. I had to crawl on my side and kind of pull myself in with my hands above my head, pull to him. And I'm laying on my side, on my left side, and I'm just 
clawing away with my bare hands at, um, at, at the rubble that's around Will. <coughs> and the whole place is still shifting. And um, he's talking to me, and uh, he's in bad shape. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to get him. He apparently was using his handcuffs to scrape away some of the rubble, and he dropped them, and he couldn't get them. Uh, so he had, he had nothing to, to help him himself to get out. And we're taking the debris that we're scra scraping away from him, and I'm pushing it along uh, my body uh, on the side in front of me, uh, and Patty would take, Patty McGee would take that, and he would throw it down the elevator shaft. And um, you can only stay in that area where Will was for just a few minutes because of the smoke and the dust. And he, we had difficulty breathing down there. We were gagging, we were choking on, uh, on the dust and the smoke. Um, so I would back out, Chuck Sirico would go in, Chuck would back out, I would go in, we would kind of tag team in Will. And all of this while we were, we were working on Will, Patty was digging, uh, finding a way out. And the guys above us now, who knew where we were, were digging down to us. There's no way we could have gotten Will out the way we came in there. So uh, they, they were working on a way to get Will out. Um, Will's going through, um, we're, we're going through the rescue operation and uh, he keeps talking about his partner. You gotta get to my partner, you gotta get to my partner. And I, I, I think in, that Dominic Pizzullo was his partner. And that uh, if he's asking me, you got to get to him, your partner, his partner, then he doesn't know that Dominic is dead. And I'm not telling him he's dead. So, because uh, I didn't want him to lose hope. So <coughs> well, I said to Will, uh, the way the rubble fell, Will, uh, we got to get you out first. We'll get we'll get your partner. We we'll, we got to get you out first, though. He's like, no, you got to get to you got to get to my partner. And um, so we're going through this uh, rescue attempt, and we're having these conversations. We're gagging on the smoke, and the firefighters up, up above us are trying to control the fire, put out the fire that is around us and, and that we're in. And the buildings four and five are starting to collapse on top of them and on top of us. And uh, they're yelling down to us, get out of there, guys, get out. You got to get out. We got to get out of here. The, the buildings are coming down. We can't control the fires. So uh, Will looks at me. And he says, uh, you're not leaving me, are you? I said, no, we're not leaving. Uh, we're staying. And um, Patty and Chuck were like, yeah, fuck them. We're not leaving. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're staying with you. We get, we'll get you out. And um, it, it had, for me, it had nothing to do with macho stuff. It had to do with self-preservation, I think. Um, how do I go home and hug my two kids when I left this guy to die? So, uh I wanted to go, but there's no way I could leave him to die. So um, we stayed, and uh, and we were working on Will, working on Will, and then all of a sudden we hear another voice, and uh, we hear somebody say, hey, how are you guys doing? And I was like, I said, who's that? And Will says, that's my partner. I said, I thought that was your partner, and I point down to Dominic. He goes, no, that's Dominic, he's dead. <laughs> and I was like, holy God, okay. So uh, I said, who, who, who is that? He says, uh, Will says, it's Sergeant, Sergeant John McLaughlin from Port Authority. I go, Sarge, Sergeant McLaughlin? He goes, yeah. He goes, Sarge, it's Scott Strauss. And then we had met, um, as uh, circumstances have it. Um, my partner, Gerard Kirchler, for 13 years in the in emergency service unit, had a... Uh, um, were teenage, hung out with John McLaughlin on Long Island. They, they knew each other. They were friends. And uh, we had gone to a couple of training sessions with Sergeant McLaughlin. So then that's where I met him. So I said, Sergeant, Scott Strauss. And he said, how are you doing? I go, how am I doing? <laughs> how are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm in some bad shape. Um, but uh, get Will out. And so we're working on Will, Sarge. And then as soon as we get Will out, we're coming for you. There's, there's a thousand people above us. And they're, they're all working to get to you. Um, so that there came a time where um, I thought I had gotten Will out. Will, Will had a, um, the former Marine uh, was up above us and he was digging a hole down to get to Will, opening up what he could from where he was. And he was, <coughs> a lot of debris was falling on top of Will and Will was on his back and it was hitting him in the face. So we asked him to stop and we'll get him out. This, this uh, from our side, um, as I'm scraping away the rubble, we, come, we see that he had an air pack on like we had on. And like the firefighters were. 
uh, former paramedic Chuck gives me uh, his uh, paramedic shears. I cut the straps on on the, this pack, and I'm yanking it out from underneath Will. And like I said, Will's on his back. He's resting on this air bottle. And uh, he, he's in some pain, and I'm causing him more pain, and I'm just apologizing to him. And I'm like, sorry, Will. He's like, don't you worry about me. You get to the sergeant. I don't care what you do. I'll get through this. You get to the sergeant. We were... All of us were worried about Will and John more than just being worried because we didn't think that, because they were so gravely injured, we didn't think that they were going to survive the rescue attempt. These guys were, these guys were hurt. These guys were, were buried, and they were, they were buried by a lot of stuff, and we didn't think that they were going to survive. So we were working, obviously, as quickly as we could. So we, we get the air pack out, we pass it out to Patty, he gets rid of it, <clears throat> and I think we got him out because now there's an oh he just drops down because now that cinder block or that big cement slab that was on top of his chest and it went on forever there was just no end to it um he, he had a gap of eight to ten inches above his chest now so I thought he was out so we took these extenders which we use when we climb bridges uh, to stop people from jumping off of bridges um, and I wrapped him around his chest and I'm trying to pull him out Willis Willis is he's hurting he's screaming in pain and I'm apologizing to him. He's just saying, don't worry about me. You get to the sergeant. So I didn't have enough um, leverage or strength to pull him out. So Chuck comes in with me. And Chuck and I are chest to chest. And we're both on our, st- on our sides trying to pull Will through, you know, get him out from underneath where he is. And Will's saying that his leg is hurt. His leg's pinned. His, my leg's pinned. My leg's pinned. So um, Chuck backs out. I climb in on top of Will. And I, I see that he's, and I'm leaning. I, I wedge myself into that eight to ten inch opening, so I'm crushing Will even more. And, <clears throat> but I got, I have to see what's in there. We didn't have any tools. The only thing I had was a small flashlight. It's the only thing you could fit in that hole. Uh, so I see that he, there's a wall pinning his left leg, his femur down, and I couldn't scrape anything out from underneath it. So I had to try to get this wall out uh, off his leg. So I back out. And I yelled to Patty, I said, I, I need a, um, an air chisel. And uh, so he yells it up to the guys upstairs, and they, they couldn't find one. Um, so they asked about airbags, which are, you know, that you lift up trucks and big objects with. I said, no, it's too, they're too big, the opening's too small. I need something really small to try to get this wall taken down. Um, well, this big this cinder block, part of a wall. And they said, how about the jaws of life, which we use to cut open cars with, you know, and when people are in car accidents. So that's, that's too big. It's not going to fit down here. He said, well, somebody yelled down, how about a battery-operated one? So oh, I'll try that. Uh, so they send one down, and they're pretty heavy. <coughs> and I push it into the, up to where Will is. And again, that opening is only 8 to 10 inches. And i got to get it onto Will's left side. So I'm jamming this thing over Will's chest. And uh, I'm apologizing for hurting him. I'm like, I'm sorry, Will. Don't, don't you worry about me. Get to the sergeant. I get it to his other side, and now I got to crawl into that opening again. And I'm laying across Will's chest, perpendicular to Will, and I'm trying to slide this, these jaws of life into where I needed to go by this wall. And I got it to where I thought it was going to work. <coughs> I back out, and I tell Pat and, uh, and Chuck, I said, guys, get out of here. Uh, get out of the hole. Get get up. Get up top. Um, I have no idea when I when I crack that wall and move this wall. I have no idea what it's holding up, and this whole thing could kill us and just crush us all. So um, so Chuck and Patty are like, nah, we're staying. We we'll, we'll, we got in here together. We're getting out together. So um, Will, Will says, uh, can you stop talking and get me out? <laughs> so. Um, I go, Will, I'm sorry, man, but listen, I don't know what this is going to do, but if we get buried, uh, there's a thousand people that know exactly where we are. We'll get you out. They'll get us all out. He's like, just just start doing it and get to the sergeant. So I crack and I'm operating the tool. I ask everybody to be quiet because I need to hear what was going on. Things started to shift. I got to stop. So started to the jaw started to open, and the cinder wall, block wall started to crack and started to, to move a little bit. But then the jaws only opened up so far, and, it, and that was the end of it. It reached its maximum opening. So I, I crawl back out, and I'm like, ah, it's, it's just not, it's not working. It's not big enough. So Chuck goes in, and he readjusts the tool, puts in some debris to, to make the opening smaller, and he backs out. <coughs> he says, try this. So I go back in there and, and, and operates. I'm operating the tool. It cracks part of the cinder block wall, and it falls off his leg. He's, he's free now, right? 
So I'm like, all right, great, we got him, we got him. We back out, put the straps around him again, we're yanking him out, now his foot's pinned. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know. Um, and while we're trying to pull Will out, uh, cop's humor, right? I said, uh, and oddly enough, we were, we were telling some jokes in that, in that hole over the, the course of those three plus hours. Um, I said, yeah, it's got, it's got to be the fat guy, right? <laughs> Will says, oh, my wife's a good cook. I said, well, she better be for the, for the picnic you're going to have, barbecue you're going to have for us when you get us out. She says, no, no, we'll have one, we'll have one. And um, so uh, now we're trying to pull Will out, and his foot is stuck, and he's, he's yelling that his foot's stuck. <coughs> so I crawl back into this hole on top of Will, and Will's on his back. I crawl up on, over his chest, and I... I move myself so I'm, I'm headed, I'm crawling on top of Will, headed down towards his, his knees and his legs. And uh, my head, and, and I'm jammed in this opening and I'm, I'm literally crushing Will. My head is by his knees and my knees are by his head. And, uh, and I said to him, yeah, you, it can't be a female cop. <laughs> um, and uh, so we, we, we laughed and uh, it, it didn't matter because none of us told who we were getting out, so we could say whatever we wanted in that hole. And um, I could see that there was a piece of rebar right across the ball of his foot, his boot. And um, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't move it. So I back out, and Will's like, just cut my leg off. Cut my leg off. Get me out of here. Get to the sergeant. While this whole thing was going on, um, the sergeant was, Sergeant McLaughlin was fading in and out of consciousness. And Patty would keep talking to him, and Patty McGee, the Irishman that he is, and McLaughlin, the Irishman that he is, uh, Patty was kept calling him Irish eyes. He's like, hey, Irish eyes, you know, you're with us? And we wouldn't hear anything. And we had thought he passed away. And Will would get upset, and he's like, Sergeant, Sarge, Sarge, are you there? Sarge, answer me. And I'm like, Will, Will, come on, let's worry about you. We'll get you. We'll get to him. We've got to get you out. He's like, you cut my leg off. You get to the sergeant. I'm like, Will, i got nothing to cut your leg off with as we're scraping this rubble away. And then the Marine above us passes down this Marine knife, and he goes, here, use this. And I'm like, oh, the fuck? You know, I'm not going to cut this guy. He's like, yeah, I cut my leg off. I go, Will, not cutting your leg off. We're going to get you out of here in one piece, you know. We'll get you out. And he's like, no, you cut my, he kept telling us to cut his leg off. Like, uh, uh, just because uh, he wanted to get the sergeant out. So now the sergeant, all of a sudden we hear the sergeant come back to life a little bit. And he's like, you know, he's groggy and you can, you can tell he's deteriorating. And um, Patty's like encouraging him, come on, Sarge, hang in there. You know, we're almost, we almost got Will, we're coming for you. And um, he's asking about the other guys on his team. And, um, you know, Patty's just trying to, change his mind on, on things, and um, he would fade out of consciousness and fade in consciousness, even back to, to life, so to speak. And uh, so we got this, we got this rebar um, up against Will's foot, and I, I, I can't move this thing at all. I don't know. There's no end to this rebar. And <coughs> I don't have the leverage. I got my hands above my head. I'm on my stomach. I'm reaching out, trying to move this rebar and trying to pull his leg out. So I yelled back to Patty. I said, Patty, I need something to, to move this piece of rebar. It's trapping his foot. I, I, Patty finds the perfect piece, length, bent the perfect way of rebar. I don't know. It was just perfect. And he, he slides it over to me, and I, I jam it into where Will's foot is, and <coughs> I'm trying to lift it up with two hands, and I'm trying to grab his leg, and it, it keeps – I don't have – enough hands to do what I needed to do. So Chuck crawls in as much as he can and he's reaching down with his hand and I'm trying to lift up the rebar and I said, just grab his pants and pull and Will is screaming. I mean, we are just hurting this man like you wouldn't believe. And I'm like, we're sorry, Will. He's like, don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Get to the sergeant. So Will, um, Chuck grabs the, uh, Will's leg, pulls it through. We get him out, <coughs> free, free him hook him up to the extenders, we drag him out. Chuck and I have to drag him out through this tiny hole. We're pulling him, pulling him through, and Will's in some bad shape, and um, he, he's in real bad shape, and uh, he's, he's hurt pretty good. We get him into the Stokes basket that was sent down from up above us, and that had Patty had dug this opening to, and the guys above dug it down, and uh, we get Will in the Stokes basket, and we, and we send that Stokes basket out. 
<coughs> I go back into the hole and talk to Sergeant McLaughlin. I said, Sarge, I, I, I'm physically shot. I can't do a thing for you. There, there's a fresh team coming right in down as I'm talking to you. They're coming, they're crawling down to us. They're going to get you out. He said, uh, he says, Scott, thanks. You know, so I was worried that, um, and so was Will, that he would give up. Uh, he got his guys out, and he's just going to pack it in. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. Uh, they got Will, uh, excuse me, they get um, John McLaughlin out like six, seven hours later. And uh, Tough day. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's obviously putting it mildly. Huh. Were, they, were they the last two? Uh, I heard that there was uh, another person who was on the surface of the rubble who was just covered in dust who was unconscious and when they woke up they kind of were like moving around and rescue workers were walking by and like whoa what's this and so i i think there were 19 18 and 19 out of 20 people that were they this other person was on the surface like i said they weren't buried so these were the last two that survived being being buried they were the last two public safety professionals yeah okay what's uh the subsequent days and weeks, what do they look like for you? Uh, they morphed into one, into the next, into the next. Um, when I when I got out of the uh, a hole and, and got topside, all I wanted to do was stand up and take a deep breath. Couldn't do either. The um, we were we were stiff. the The area that we were working on in Will was um, probably uh, the size of an average chair in between the, the floor and, and the bottom of a chair. And our place of refuge, when, when I was working on Will and Chuck was out with Patty, and then when Chuck was working on Will and I was out with Patty, uh, that area was no bigger than the area underneath the table. You, it, we, were, we were jammed in a very tight spot with the smoke and the dust and, and the heat. Um, it, it, was, it was a bad place. And then when I got top signed, I'm talking to Kenny Winkler, and uh, I said, Kenny, it's, it's John McLaughlin. And, uh, you know, and he's like, he said, yeah, I heard. Um, I said, you got to get him out. Like, and he looks at me like, like if it wasn't John, I wasn't going to get him out. <laughs> you know, so I don't know why I said it, but I just said it. And I said, you got to get some small tools down there. Nothing big's going to fit. He says, I got it. And um, the reason why I couldn't take a deep breath and the reason why I couldn't stand up is, one, I was so stiff. It hurt. I was, in, I was hurting. I was so tired, and then the atmosphere up there was almost as bad as in the hole. You had the buildings burning around us, the fires, and the smoke coming up from the ground below us, the debris. Those guys were in some bad spots too. Uh, so uh, I'm being helped off the pile of the, the hundreds of rescue workers because uh, I, I had trouble seeing. I couldn't breathe. I had rocks and debris in my mouth, dust. I had, I had my eyes. They were, guys were pouring water on me as I was walking by, uh, and I was holding on to a police officer in front of me. And another officer was holding me up. We're just getting down the uh, down off the pile, <coughs> and <coughs> get down to an ambulance. And they put me on a stretcher. And uh, I said, "Guys, don't cut my clothes off." And they're like, What's, "What? What are you talking about?" I said, well, "Paramedic, right? They, you're in a car accident. You fall down. They cut your clothes off." <laughs> I was a city cop. I had no money. I couldn't afford to buy a new clothes, <laughs> buy another uniform. I said, "I said, I, I didn't fall. I don't have any broken bones. I'm just so tired. And I can't see and I can't breathe. Don't cut my clothes off." So they, uh, they take me to Bellevue and uh, where Will is. And uh, Will had come off the pile after me. They, were, uh, they had doctors up on top of the pile who were ready, which I didn't know until later, that they were ready to talk us through amputating his leg. Uh, thankfully, that didn't, ha that didn't happen. Um, so they were treating Will on the top. I was coming down the pile. And then um, we both end up in Bellevue. And when I get to Bellevue, uh, oh, as I'm coming down that pile, I, I, I just have my eyes closed and I'm holding on to the, 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 the cop in front of me. And I hear somebody say to me, uh, hey, I guess you didn't make the meeting either. And um, that night on September 11th is my, was my volunteer fire department's meeting that night. And <clears throat> I, I, the, the person that said that is a city fireman. And he was in my fire department on Long Island. And it was uh, Tom Ozuski, and he's got a very distinct voice. And I go, hey, Zeus, I'm glad to hear your voice. And he goes, uh, hey, you, how do you know it's me? I said, you can't see the way you look, you know, because I was just encrusted and stuff. And, and uh, I said, I can hear that voice. And I know that voice anywhere. He says, that's good to see you, Scott. So 
Uh, I get down to Bellevue, my partner from the police department, uh, emergency service unit, he retired in March of 2001. Uh, he saw what was going on on, t on TV, on the news, uh, and he goes into the house, gets his old uniforms out, was only, and puts them on, he races back to work, and uh, his Gerard Kushler was my partner, and his brother Kevin was in emergency with us, and he was there with us down there in the, at, the, at the pile. And word got back to Gerard, who was in our building handling phone calls and just coordinating things out of the base there. Uh, word got back to him, and this is, you know, 11 30, 12, 12 30, sometime that 11, September 11th at night. Uh, word got back to him that your brother is hurt and is on his way to Bellevue. So he went to Bellevue. <coughs> thinking it was his brother and when I they wheel me in he goes hey what are you doing here I go what, what am I doing here what are you doing here you retired he says I wasn't missing this you know and uh, and that's true for every retired emergency cop didn't they wanted to be there um, and I got out of the hospital on September 12th uh, somewhere around 11 8 10 11 o'clock in the morning I don't remember and uh, I get back to my building and the lieutenant is there and he says uh, Scott I you Go get, grab some sleep or uh, uh, go home, do whatever, but I need you back here at 5 o'clock. Because they started, even though it was September 12th, you realize that you can't work 24-7. So they started to break it up into two shifts. So <coughs> I decided to go home and see my kids. Um, just go home, try to take a shower, maybe get a little rest. I, I, I go home, and I can't sleep. I'm still, I'm still wired up, even though I've been up since... September 10th uh, at, at 7 o'clock at night. It is now the morning of September 12th and coming into the afternoon and I just can't sleep. And um, my kids get off the bus about 3 o'clock. <coughs> and I'm giving them hugs. And uh, I said, I got to go back to work. My wife comes home from work now. And I said, I got to go back to work. And they're like, Dad, don't go. We don't want you to die like all the other people. And I'm like, I got to go. And uh, Gave him a hug, got my car, and went back to work. And we started looking for people and looking for people. And we weren't finding anybody else. We were finding plenty of body parts. Uh, the things we saw um, will haunt us forever. Uh, the things we uh, had to do to help bring um, a family member home uh, will haunt us forever. Um, and just one day morphed into the next. And there was, there was a time where we're all so tired and we're, we're just we're just exhausted and we're going through so much um, that we're on our way and I don't know what day it was but we're on our way back down to the pile and we're in a police van and guys from my unit uh, we're laughing we're just we're just overtired we're just punched punch drunk so to speak and we're just you know laughing about whatever and um, people are applauding us as we get closer to ground zero. People are lined the streets with signs, thank you, and you're our heroes. And <coughs> so we were uh, like, ah, what are we, in a fire truck? You know, because every, everybody loves a fireman. Nobody likes a cop, you know. And you, you could be standing outside a store, and if Mrs. Jones has little Johnny and little Johnny's acting up, they're like, you, if you don't behave, that policeman's going to arrest you. It's like, really? You know? So we always get the bed rap. And uh, so we were laughing, oh, it must be in a fire truck, you know? And uh, so we were laughing about that. And then as we turn a corner to head uh, further south, as one of the – a kid um, – probably about the same age as mine, had a sign that said, please find my daddy. And uh, that, that was tough. It just brought us back to what we had to do and where we were going. Um, I couldn't tell you if we found him or if he was found, um, but it was tough. And then, um, and then we had the funerals and uh, some tough times. Yeah. So we're at 20 years. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy to think <laughs> that there are men and women walking the streets these days that were not alive, yeah. you know. With that said, you meet one of these individuals who was not around yeah. 20 years ago. What's the message you're gonna give them about the men and women who responded to the call to service that day. The men and women 
of the New York City Police Department, the Fire Department, uh, EMS, the construction crews, the volunteers from restaurants, everybody that pitched in to do something, the donations. Nobody cared if what color you were. Nobody cared what religion you were, what you looked like, how you acted, what your record was, how good you did in school. Nobody gave a crap about anything other than doing everything they could to help everybody. And it's a shame we're not there. And it's it, people, firefighters, police officers, EMS workers, the original responders in there, the people that were in the buildings helping each other get down those stairs and get out of that building. It wasn't, it wasn't just the firefighters. It wasn't just the police officers that were in that building. There were civilians in that building helping civilians get down those stairs. And it was just New Yorkers helping New Yorkers. It was people helping people. It was the entire country. We, had, we got donations from, and not only physical donations, but we had um, uh, rescue workers from all around the country come to New York, go to, Pent go to the Pentagon to help. And, and everybody came together. We were one nation. One, the flags were everywhere. The patriotism that went on uh, on September 12th for months was amazing. Absolutely amazing. It was a shame that a tragedy like this took us, uh, to, cost, took to get us there. Um, it, people just doing what they had to do, doing what was right. Nobody cared about anything else other than helping the guy next to you. The movie The World Trade Center is uh, about Will and John. It's about their families, how they got through the day, what they relied on and uh, on each other to get to keep each other alive, literally. Um, I think my part of the movie is, and I had these discussions with Oliver Stone on the set, is not true to the way it was. It uh, is probably one of the few times that uh, Hollywood made something less glamorous than it was, you know, less intense than it was. Uh, when I explained to Oliver Stone what it was like in that hole, how I was literally on top of Will and at times couldn't see him because of the smoke and the dust um, and how compacted it was and how tight it was, um, he said, um, if I'd made a movie like that, no one would see it. They'd run out of the theater. They would be claustrophobic. They wouldn't, they, you, who wants to look at a black screen? And I said, well, that's not the way it was. In real life, this is what happened. And he says, hey, Scott, stick to being a cop. I'll stick to making movies. <laughs> 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 so uh, uh, we, we had a couple of uh, arguments on the set, actually. And um, my partner, uh, Gerard Kushler, who is, uh, he's in the movie. Um, uh, he, Oliver, he's standing there during one of these arguments, and he goes to Oliver Stone. He says, "Hey, you're in charge, not him." And he points to me, and Oliver Stone says, uh, "I'm not so sure anymore." <laughs> uh, and there was one point where Oliver got pissed at me, and he walked off the set. He says, "Do whatever the fuck you want." And uh, so people come over to me like, "Okay, what do you want to do?" I'm like, "What do I want? I don't know what I want to <laughs> do." But they were already filming, and the movie was uh, so you couldn't change anything. But the movie is not about me, it's not about the rescuers, it is about Will and John. And if you haven't seen it, it is not about the terrorists, it's not about the buildings collapsing, it's, to me, that movie's about how those two gentlemen uh, got through that day, and uh, for the love of their family and their faith, and that's what got them through.